Welcome back to Physics 371 Online. Here I'm going to work out a very simple example that shows how to use Ampere's Law to find the magnetic field inside a linear magnetic material. So here's the problem. An infinite cylindrical solenoid has n turns per unit length, which tells you how tightly the wire is wound around the cylinder, and it carries a current I. So each turn of wire has the same current. It's filled with a linear material with magnetic susceptibility chi sub m. Find the magnetic field inside the linear material. And by this, of course, we mean find B. Now what I've shown here in the sketch is just a cylinder, and I'm assuming that it's completely filled with this linear material. So let me just mark the z-axis for reference. All right, so that's the z-hat direction here. And uh, the cylinder, we might uh, think of it having a radius r, although uh, that may or may not come into play in the solution to the problem. So we'll just put this down here. So it's filled with a material that has magnetic susceptibility chi sub m, and we want to know b inside. Well, uh, remember, of course, that we're talking here about a solenoid, and so the wire windings carry a current like this. I'll just draw a couple of them, but of course they extend all along the uh, length of the solenoid axis, and the, that's where the current I goes. Now we've argued in uh, previous uh, chapters that the symmetry of a solenoid is such that the magnetic field inside is along the axis. And we've used Ampere's law previously to prove that the magnetic field outside is zero. And so I'm not going to repeat those calculations, but we will make use of them in choosing how to attack this problem. All right, so let's just write this down. We know by symmetry and through previous results that B is along Z hat inside, right? It's along the axis. And B equals zero outside. And the same symmetry that we know for B also holds true for H, right? So we can say that H is along Z inside, and H is also equal to zero outside, because we're going to use Ampere's law in the form uh, where it's written in terms of H, so we can solve for H first. And I'll just remind you that if you were to go back to try to solve for B directly, B dot DL, right? integrated around a closed loop is mu naught times i enclosed. You could do that for this problem, or at least you could try to do that, but what you'd have to remember is that this i on the right hand side is the total i. It has to be due to free currents plus any bound currents that are enclosed by the loop that you choose. And in this problem we're not given information about the magnetization and the magnetization is what you would need in order to find the bound currents. So this is not the best approach. Whenever you have a magnetic material, you're going to want to use Ampere's law in the form integral around a closed loop of h dot dl right, is equal to i free enclosed that will be the easiest way to do it. So we'll do that first. That's what's appropriate for this problem. Okay, we know the orientation, as I said, that h is along z hat inside and outside it's zero. So the easiest way for us to choose an Ampereian loop would be to choose one so that the sides of the loop are either parallel to b or perpendicular to it, right? And so this is exactly the kind of loop that we've used before in solenoid type problems. So it's a rectangular loop. We're going to define the height L. If we need to, we can also define where the left and right hand edges are, but it turns out we won't need to in this problem. So we will integrate around this loop. Uh, I'll, I'll integrate in the clockwise direction around the loop. So we've got uh, on the left hand side actually four terms and I'm gonna go to the trouble to write them all out just to remind you uh, what happens to those so we have we'll do side one side two side three and
and sine 4 down here. So h dot dl1 plus integral h dot dl2 integral h dot dl3 huh, plus the integral of h dot dl4 and on the right hand side we just need the free current that flows through that loop. Now remember these windings are flowing uh, they each carry a current I and as many windings as there are that pass through that loop that's that's how much current we're going to have. So we need to know the total number of windings. Now if if we're given that there are n turns per unit length and we have a, a vertical length L for the Amperian loop then there will be a total number of turns of wire t that would be equal to n times L and each one carries a current I. So on the right hand side we have N times L times I. That's our total free current that passes through the loop. Alright, now let's simplify the left hand side. On the left hand side H dot DL1, well we know that H is in the Z direction and DL1 is also in the Z direction. So this first integral just becomes H DL because they're parallel and oops, look what I've done. I made a mistake. I really need to get rid of that vector sign on top of the H because it's not a vector anymore. I've realized that the dot product is such that the two parallel vectors just give me H times DL. So it's wrong to write the vector sign there. The second term, H dot DL2, well that's going to be zero because along DL2, along the top side of the loop, H is either perpendicular to the DL or 0 outside, right? So here this is equal to 0 and I'll just jot down that this is because H is perpendicular to DL2. DL3 on the outside that's facing down, well we know that this term is 0 because H is equal to 0 outside. And then DL4 is similar to DL2, right? Along that path DL and H are perpendicular to each other. So that term is also 0 for the same reason that the second integral was 0. So the integral now, we, we're left with the integral H dot DL uh, on the left hand side and here we use symmetry again uh, to argue that H should be the same everywhere along this loop DL, right? No matter what distance it is from the center, the cylindrical symmetry of the case should have H uh, uniform all along that side so we'll pull the H outside the integral H integral DL and I should have a 1 here because it's on side 1 and that's equal then to N times L times I and this integral uh, of DL1 from bottom to top on side 1 is just L right it's just the length of that side so HL equals N L I and directly we've now found H. H it's equal, you see the L cancels out on both sides of this equation, H is equal to N times I, that's the magnitude of it, that's the result that comes from Ampere's law and I'll just put in the vector nature of it because we know it's along the Z direction. So this is what H is inside and, and here's the beauty of this method once we know H we don't even have to worry about the magnetization because we can directly find B, right? Now we can go back to our expression that B is equal to mu naught times 1 plus the magnetic susceptibility times H and so we're left with B is just mu naught 1 plus chi m times H which is N I and it's in the Z hat direction. So the magnetic field inside this material is a very simple expression that comes directly from the solution using Ampere's law to find H. Uh, notice that if the uh, cylinder were empty, if there were no material inside there at all, we would still have the same H. None of the reasoning that led to the solution for H would change. It would just be a material, we, we would have no material, right? So that would be where chi is equal to zero. And so if there's no material inside there, B would simply be mu naught times H, and it would be this expression here without the 1 plus chi sub m. 
So you have some homework problems where uh, you get to do this kind of approach uh, to solve for the magnetic field uh, inside some kind of magnetic material. Uh, and, and here we haven't talked at all about whether the material inside is uh, paramagnetic or diamagnetic because that simply would be reflected in the value of chi sub m. So I hope this makes uh, sense and helps you uh, as you do the homework problems. I'll see you in class.